Heaven, hell, bartering for souls, a hero who's already been to hell, and a demon named Maman? Seriously? Haven't I reviewed this stuff already? Like, a lot? The following is an in-depth story analysis. If you haven't seen this film, you might want to before watching this review. My perceptions of superhero culture are a lot different now than they were when I started Superhero Rewind. It was like the world right before the invention of the electric light bulb. A lot of us didn't think it could get any better, and we were naive enough to think we'd hit the pinnacle of what the superhero genre had to offer. I used to call the mid-2000s the superhero onslaught. Then 2008 came, and Dark Knight and Iron Man changed everything. Now superhero properties generally gross the largest amount of Hollywood's take in a year, and there are more comic book shows on TV than there were space operas in the late 90s. A lot of us are calling this a new golden age for superheroes on screen. When I look back on this year a decade from now, I wonder if I'll still perceive it as such. Because I don't see the mid-2000s as a superhero boom anymore. Now, it's like puberty. It's growing pains. A genre with an inferiority complex and no real sense of identity. It had finally made it to high school, but it was awkward and timid and experimenting and trying to get girls to like it. I've reviewed most of the superhero movies from this period, and a lot of them were like a pimply-faced teenager. Shy, not sure how to present themselves, and a little afraid of being seen in public. That's not to say that doesn't still happen now. All of us from time to time make mistakes we would have made in our youth. In 2005, Constantine watched to me like a bold step forward, a comic book movie that wasn't afraid of the zaniness and absurdity of its source material, and one that was a lot more for people who already really liked these kinds of movies, rather than trying to be so accessible that it had to hold my hand like I'm a five-year-old trying to make my way across three lanes of traffic. It's not another origin movie. This is a fully realized, high-concept world we get to just drop right down in the middle of and learn about as we go through an ostensibly normal person who, just like us, doesn't know about how the mystical world behind the world works. Through Angela, yeah, of course, that's her name, we get to catch up with our protagonist who's already been dealing with this stuff for years. While he fights with cool magical artifacts and does spells and sarcastically quips about how BS he thinks the spiritual system of this world is, I thought it was incredibly brave to build this world through a story about what might very well be the tail end of a hero's career and really explore who this guy is, what he wants, and why he's so angry with God, rather than telling the far less interesting story about how he got so angry with God in the first place, which would likely play as a background film to set the stage for a real movie. As I've said many times, there are plenty of cases where there's a fantastic story in a hero's origin. Batman Begins was released the very same year, but a big rule of thought for me is that if an origin film mostly just makes us Jones for a sequel and it hardly stands alone in a vacuum, the wrong movie got made. I doubt I'd like the first X-Men film nearly as well as I do if X2 had never been made. I mean, it's an okay pilot, but not a great movie on its own. So Constantine was really refreshing at the time because it took some of Hellblazer's most popular and interesting source material and, albeit pretty loosely, adapted a story from them that doesn't hinge on its becoming a franchise. That's a double-edged sword, of course, because it borders on going too far the other way, looking desperate to get as much comic book stuff on screen as it can in case it doesn't get another opportunity. It throws maybe too much stuff on screen at once, which is another problem some of these Growing Pains movies had, like X3. We don't spend nearly enough time with John's supporting cast to feel as bad as I'd like to when most of them are killed off. And Chaz oddly disappears through the whole middle of the film to the point where we forget he's even in this movie until suddenly he's back and we spend just enough time with him the movie feels justified in giving him a tragic death too. It's less timid than a lot of other superhero movies from the time, but it does lead to a whole other can of worms, or matchbook of Beatles. Unlike Sin City, another comic book movie released the same year, it wasn't confident enough with the source material to bring it straight off the page, so it employs three pretty common strategies in adapting a cult property in an attempt to make it mainstream enough to earn its $100 million budget back. 
A, it reels back the violence to make it appropriate for teenagers and above. It's in that strange place between PG-13 and R that Spawn was in, except it surprisingly lands on the other side of PG-13. Just a decade later, I imagine this exact movie would be rated PG-13, and even in 2005, I'm not sure what ultimately nudged it over that threshold. I don't think the violence would do it, especially because so much of what's being slaughtered are demons with a color of blood other than red. There's no nudity, and even a joke about John wishing there was, but decides that the scene can happen without it. And it even has the allotted number of F-bombs for PG-13. I don't know that it would have performed any better with a lower rating, but for anyone familiar with the original material, this treatment might have seemed a little more understandable if the studio was intentionally trying to get a PG-13 rating. I imagine Hellblazer fans were somewhat disappointed with such a tame movie that's still rated R, a rating that would allow for a tone much closer to the comics. And don't get me wrong, the movie boasts some pretty haunting and legitimately unnerving moments. Some of the CG is a little dated, but I love the gothic design of the half-head demons and the contemporary Adam Bomb Blast version of Hell really stuck with me. But when a deleted scene gets cut because it's about a couple of Border Patrol officers shooting themselves in the mouth that cuts to black as soon as the triggers are pulled, it's clear that it's going for more of a mainstream audience. B, it turns what was either a straight-up horrible person or an anti-hero into a superhero. Even if you want to drastically change story elements and mythology in an adaptation, it's usually a good rule of thumb to keep your hero as true to the spirit of the original as possible. But even that's a rule I've seen broken to wonderful effect. If Stanley Ipkiss had been translated straight from comics to screen in The Mask, he would have been a complete psychopathic killer with practically no redeeming qualities whatsoever. That would have been a gratuitously violent shoot him up would have appealed to a different and more limited audience and almost certainly wouldn't have been the powerhouse success it was nor the thoughtful study of identity it turned into probably also wouldn't have starred Jim Carrey. Constantine is a similar animal. A guy as morally bereft as Constantine in the mid-2000s would have been too big a risk to throw a $100 million budget at. So while his motivations are self-serving throughout the movie, and he's certainly not a nice or even always sympathetic person, he never hurts a human being, and he's indisputably a straight-up selfless hero by the end. He's played as the lovable cynic. He acts like he doesn't care about anyone but himself, maybe even thinks that himself, but proves he cares more about the immortal soul of someone whose plight resonates with him because he was her once, someone in hell who didn't deserve to be, and he'd rather go there himself than see her suffer for all eternity beside him. The short-lived NBC Constantine from 2014 got a lot closer to the comic book version. He's a lot more morally ambiguous there, and he's got the same comic book motivation where his actions sent someone to hell rather than himself. He's still a great deal more compassionate there than he usually is in Vertigo comics. And C, it's used as a star vehicle for an A-list actor. Funny, I guess the mask actually uses all three of these. Keanu Reeves, of course, doesn't remotely fit the bill for comic book Constantine, or Constantine, except that I guess he pulls off the theatrical, ultra-sarcastic bit pretty well. It's still his own flavor before it's the Constantine from the comics. The similarities begin and end with he's cynical and jaded and has a silver tongue. Keanu Reeves doesn't fake an English accent, which is probably for the best, and he uses his natural hair color. I imagine the logic behind all this was not a lot of people know anything about John Constantine, so we'll loosely adapt it and make it a lot more about Keanu Reeves in another ultra-stylized, gritty-looking genre movie that questions the nature of reality. This is, after all, Reeves' very next star role after the Matrix trilogy wrapped up two years prior. And wouldn't you know it, it has a ridiculous amount of things in common with the Matrix. It's basically the occult Matrix. So Keanu Reeves stars as a man wearing a white shirt with a black suit and tie in a bleak and dilapidated looking world sapped of color, who is born with a sixth sense. He can feel that something is behind the scenes pulling the strings of the world. The world is not as it seems. He's ultimately a messiah figure who is destined to give his life to save the world, and he was planted there deliberately by the powers that be to stop an ambitious being that used to be a vital part of the system and hates humanity from causing genocide. An arch nemesis that ends up experiencing experiencing what it's like to be exactly what they hate, human. 
but it's up to him to choose to be the savior of the world or not. He has the ability to see beyond the seams of reality and can even bend reality beyond the accepted laws of natural physics. Things get really hard when his enemies break through their own plane of existence and stop playing by the rules. Our hero often has to slow down time in order to achieve his objectives. He visits a wise sage of African descent with special access to information he doesn't have in order to determine his next move. He descends into hell and is risen by the end. There's also an overzealous kid who follows him around and wants to be his apprentice. He falls in love with a woman who has the same abilities he has but isn't quite as good at it as he is and he is inexplicably intertwined with his destiny. He winds up in a high-rise building he nearly falls out the window of, gets rained on a lot, and begins his journey in a room with really over-the-top red chairs. Now, obviously, this and The Matrix aren't telling exactly the same story, and the comparison I just made lumps all three of The Matrix films together, but clearly this movie is being sold almost unabashedly on the heels of the success of that franchise. The basic themes are the same. Destiny versus free will, faith, sacrifice, the nature of the world, and humanity's place in it. Though they ultimately walk similar paths, and both are, at least at first, looking to control their own destinies, and both have really melodramatic speech patterns, these two protagonists are driven by different motivations. Neo is simply looking for his place in this frightening world that's suddenly opening up to him. While John has fought against his realization of a horrifying world, but has found a place and is desperately trying to hang on to it, the Matrix, in making its hero an almost literal Jesus, also creates an allegory for Judeo-Christian mythology, while Constantine just uses it and reinvents it, making it outlandish enough that it practically watches like it's a metaphor for the very thing it's outright using. This made-up mythology and the creative magical relics that derive their power from being used for horrible deeds, like the electric chair at Sing Sing, which is kind of like a mystical cerebro, add an absurdity to this material that makes it more entertaining and lighter. It deals with some heavy issues, like whether suicide should always be considered a terrible act, but it does so within a really exaggerated context. So even though we're dealing with real life religious concepts that a whole lot of people believe in, those ideas are explored through the context of characters who live in an escapist fantasy. Although Constantine sells itself on some of the same aesthetics and even similar ideas to The Matrix, and although it's working overtime to be more accessible to a general audience than the comics, it mostly succeeds at achieving its own unique style and flavor. It's not confused in its identity. It's a superhero movie masquerading as a supernatural thriller, in exactly the same way The Mask was a superhero movie disguised as a supernatural comedy romance. There are a lot of familiar superhero elements and tropes here, but they're repackaged in a creative way. It's the age-old story of man's frustrating limitations, his struggle to understand the cruel, unfair world around him, and his yearning to remake the world into the fair and just place he thinks it should be already. John is a cynic who believes God is as he puts it, a kid with an ant farm. God doesn't understand what it's like to be human, an accusation he makes of Gabriel, which is an insult he clearly means for God himself as well. And God's rules are arbitrary and pointless. John is a rebellious teenager, lashing out at a father who doesn't understand and doesn't trust him because he doesn't like his lot in life. God gave him the ability to see demons, and it made his life hell. So when he was a teenager... That's interesting. He killed himself and damned his soul to hell because suicide is a mortal sin. So when he was resuscitated two minutes later, all he could do was live his life, knowing the demons are real because he just had first-hand experience with full-fledged ones, and knowing when he died again, there was nowhere to go but down. John doesn't think that's fair, and even though he could simply repent and be absolved of that sin, he can't bring himself to do that because he doesn't believe in God or his system. And I like the distinction Gabriel makes between knowing and believing. He knows God God is real, he just can't submit to a God who operates that way. I imagine even if he wanted to repent, he couldn't hope to make it sincere enough because he doesn't believe he did anything wrong. How could anyone expect a boy going through what he did not to take his own life? He thinks enough good work should get him into heaven, so he helps people by exorcising demons. The question throughout the film is whether John is really only helping people for himself, as Gabriel suggests, or if he became the John Constantine because he couldn't stand by and watch while demons broke the rules and hurt people, knowing he could stop them. When he shows his true colors at the end and makes the heroic sacrifice, it's hard to know if he's finally changed and come to care enough about another person more than he does himself, or if deep down he always had that kind of compassion and he had so much resentment toward God he was too focused on the fate of his own moral soul to even realize that about himself. 
When John offers his soul for another's, it grants him entry into heaven and gets him closer to believing over simply knowing. I like that Satan cures his cancer and keeps him alive so he'll have the opportunity to prove he really belongs in hell. Perhaps the rules seem a little less arbitrary when he realizes how important he is in the grand scheme. If his suicide had taken 20 years ago, there would be no one to stop Gabriel's mad scheme to bring about Maman's reign. One could argue that the sacrifice is a loophole, the one good deed a person can do that automatically guarantees they won't go to hell, but I think the idea is that it proves ultimate humility. It's not the act of the sacrifice, but rather the selflessness that leads to that act, which is consistent with the notion of humbly asking for forgiveness and admitting your faults. Good and evil are boiled down here to selflessness and selfishness. Jesus set the example when he died on the cross. The angels give freely of themselves, serve God and the human race with the promise of nothing in return. Pure good is sacrifice. And the demons are all out for themselves. I like how that's encapsulated toward the beginning with the demon John's trying to exercise who gets distracted when it admires its own reflection in the mirror. I like the example John's friends and colleagues set for him throughout the movie, each of them sacrificing their own lives because, as Beeman says, John has never had reason to believe, but that doesn't mean they don't believe in John. Each of them is faced with his greatest vice, and that's ultimately his undoing. But they aren't punished for their sins, they're just ironically murdered, mostly by Balthazar, who sees humans as pathetic playthings and probably just thinks it's funny. I don't think there's anything more going on there than that. What it says for John, though, is that nobody's perfect. He can't do enough good works to gain entry into heaven because it's all about purity and righteousness, which Beeman, Hennessy, and Chaz all achieve through their bravery and humility in risking their lives for the greater good. I like to think John follows the example of his friends, and this is good people in their darkest hour inspiring a man to be his best self in his. But the movie is really vague about this. It's a subtlety I would appreciate more if it weren't for the voiceover at the end that blatantly spells out the message and makes John seem to come around to God's point of view far too easily. The final lines of the movie, said over John standing on a roof and chewing nicotine gum, are, I guess God has a plan for all of us. I had to die twice just to figure that out. Like the book says, he works his work in mysterious ways. Some people like it, some people don't. It's funny how critics were as polarized on this movie as people seem to be about God. It's instantly a way better story if you just drop that out entirely. Just show John on the roof with the gum. He's been given a third chance. He's no longer destined to go to hell, so he's taking better care of himself because he's not so fatalistic. And metaphorically, he's not constantly putting fire in his body because he's no longer facing an eternity of fire. But I think he'd still be cynical or at the very least really skeptical about what he calls earlier in the movie God's hypocritical BS. It actually uses the swear word. Okay, so he's maybe accepted that his psychic powers are a gift and not a curse. Again, without him, Maman would have taken over the earth allegedly. We'll get to that later. And perhaps he's decided that God knew what kind of man he was, even if he didn't, so Isabel was allowed to go to hell because he needed someone to sacrifice his life for. So at the end of the day, the rules may look arbitrary, but justice was still going to win the day. God's plan for John was to sacrifice his life to save Isabel, and his plan for Isabel was to kill herself so he would make the right choice. But who knows? After all, this is a world with free will. What if John had asked Satan for that extension instead? Would Isabel have been released from hell because things didn't work out the way God intended? God never directly interferes and doesn't physically manifest like Satan does. Super creepy, bipolar Satan. So it's hard to be sure what his plan is beyond hoping everyone follows Christ's example. How is John not looking at what happened with Isabel and still crying foul on God? Unless the whole thing really was an elaborate plan to set him up to do the right thing at the end, what happens to her is not only unfair, it's against the rules as we understand them. Suicide is a mortal sin, but if you kill yourself for the greater good, isn't that, you know, a sacrifice? As far as I understand it, and this isn't made nearly explicit enough. The idea is that Isabel somehow realized someone was coming after her to be the vessel to bring Maman to Earth, so she killed herself to prevent that from happening. Why does that count as a suicide in the first place, though? It's the equivalent of taking a bullet for the entire human race. I get that the whole story is about how life's not fair and it's difficult to accept drawing the short straw, but the sentiment we're left with at the end oversimplifies that and wraps up in a nice, neat bow. Oh, I see what God's doing. Okay, I may not like the system, but at least God has a plan for everyone. That's taking the new positive attitude he's gained by the end of his character arc to a ridiculous extreme, I think. 
But I like everything about John's nemesis. Gabriel is an excellent foil for John because she's motivated by the same frustrations he is, and is actually describing herself a lot when she talks about John. She says John needs to demonstrate a capacity for sacrifice, and that everything he's ever done has only been for himself. It's Gabriel who hates God's system so much, she wants to bring about Armageddon just to punish God's people for having his favor over the angels. Her plot is a little more original than your standard wipe out nearly everyone and start fresh to create a brave new world kind of plot. Her justification is that human beings thrive in adversity. We often demonstrate the best version of ourselves in our darkest hour, kind of like the scenario in The Dark Knight with the boats and the people who refuse to be first to blow up the other. She thinks it's too easy that man is allowed to do every heinous thing imaginable but then simply repent and go to heaven. She actually comes right out and says exactly what John is feeling about his situation it's not fair. She spins it like she's doing humanity a service. She says, I'll make you worthy of God's love. And the really interesting thing is, she has a point. It's not until John finds himself in his lowest place that he becomes the best version of himself and discovers that selfless capacity in trying to stop Gabriel's insane plot that's ostensibly all about doing exactly that. But just as it was with John all the way up until the end, it's about the motivation behind it. Gabriel's not doing this for humanity, she's doing it for revenge. She's lashing out like a rebellious teenager, just like John was. The difference is, I think, that deep down, John doesn't want what happened to him to happen to anyone else. Gabriel's so vain, she probably thinks this movie's about her. She's the victim serving humanity and never getting anything in return. She wants to give the earth to a demon as ambitious and self-serving as she is, which just goes to show where her priorities are. So while there's some truth to her statement about people needing pain and hardship to rise above, she's acting purely out of jealousy and spite and serves by the end as John's opposite. And I love that by the end she gets exactly what she claims she wants. She gets God's favor if she repents. She gets to be human. But of course that's not actually what she wanted at all. Angela is also on a road to redemption of her own. John is initially damned to hell because he took his own life. Angela blames herself for her sister's death because she denied her own visions. Both of them refuse to face the reality of their gifts, which allow them to see the world as it really is. Both suffer consequences for that, and both live in their own unique brand of denial. After he's been to hell, John can't ignore what he knows to be true. So instead, he ignores the rules and lives as though the world were as it would be if he was the man in charge. Angela on the other hand, sees how the visions are affecting her sister, who periodically gets sent to a mental institution and decides to ignore her visions altogether. Interesting that both tacks end up leading to somebody killing themselves. Angela not only ignores her powers, but ultimately discounts her faith altogether. She and John are on parallel journeys together, and they help each other gain something each is missing, but the other has. John has learned to accept the game Heaven and Hell are playing, but he lacks humility, and Angela has plenty of humility. She's ready to give up her life for her sisters without hesitation, but she has a hard time believing that hell exists and that her sister has gone there. I like that Angela isn't just an obligatory love interest. She's our eyes into this world, but she's also an integral part of it without realizing it or wanting to realize it. Like John, she's thrust into a role she doesn't want but has to learn to accept in order to help someone she cares about. They complement each other as a duo. They need each other. One is an extreme optimist and the other an extreme pessimist. Working together, they learn to find a healthy balance. We can see John rediscovering some of his humanity the more screen time they share together. An arc telegraphed by Angela picking up the glass of smoke John's trapped a helpless spider under. And John in turn forces Angela in a number of wonderfully tense scenes to look at the world for what it is and regain her objectivity and groundedness. I also like that while there's a natural chemistry and sexual tension between them, the romance is gradual and takes a back seat to the immediate earth-shattering problems at hand. It rarely feels feels natural for a brand new couple to stop everything to make out or talk about how they're falling in love with each other when one or both of them is the only thing standing between Earth and total annihilation. Each time it looks like we might be interrupting everything for the obligatory kiss, something else is really going on. Like when Constantine uses going in for a kiss as a strategy to get Hennessy's protective amulet around Angela's neck. Well, I think a lot of that thematic and character 
extra stuff is more or less thoughtfully put together, except for that infernal voiceover at the end, some basic story execution leaves a lot to be desired. First of all, and I don't know that I've ever had cause to complain about this before, but this is some of the worst sound mixing I've ever heard. The score overpowers the dialogue, and that combined with a lot of mumbling makes it nearly impossible to pick up on basic story points without subtitles. I had no idea what the heck Hennessy was even doing with the whited out eyes of the newspapers and what was up with the amulet until I finally watched that scene where John asked him to take the amulet off with subtitles. That scene is almost totally incomprehensible without looking at the script. John asked Father Hennessy to listen to the ether. I could never tell what the heck he was saying there. Hennessy has the ability to pick up on the goings-on of the spiritual world, but he can't control it without a special amulet that keeps the voices away. It's disturbing, and it's driven him to drink. He's a really sad character and has a lot in common with John, but he's embraced his gift, and even though it's hard and has made him really mousy and paranoid, he keeps his faith and uses it when he has to. I was totally lost on that until this viewing, so I cared a lot more about his death, even though I still wish that we got to spend a little more time with all these people. There's also a lot more clever banter and one-liners than I ever realized. When Midnight puts his arms through John, angry with him for asking him a neutral party to take sides, John says, that's a two hundred dollar shirt by the way funny moment i had no idea what he said without the subtitles i praised the movie at the start for giving the audience some credit not feeling the need to stop every five seconds to explain things just because we're in a high concept universe but this movie has a tendency to go way too far in the other direction it's presented in such a confident deliberate way that whenever i miss important details i always assumed it must just be me and i'm not paying close enough attention but there are a number of things the movie simply never tells us whether you're reading the script along with it or not there's a big mystery made out of how demons are crossing over into our plane which is supposed to be impossible but by the end, it's all about Maman crossing over, and there's a clear recipe in the Hell Bible on how to do that, but not any of the other demons. Oh, side note, I have a really hard time buying that John doesn't know about that already, and that he needs Beeman to explain to him about Maman and how he could cross over. I mean, it could have just been John explaining it to Angela, that would have been fine, but then it doesn't give Beeman enough to do, I guess. I assume the demons are able to cross over because it has something to do with the Spear of Destiny, but John acts like this is the first time in history demons have ever been able to cross over, and the Spear has been used before, as evidenced by the Nazi flag it's wrapped up in when Manuel finds it. Is that somehow a side effect of what Gabriel is trying to unleash? It starts happening well before she gets her hands on the Spear. There's a psychic she had hoped to use who killed herself, and a demonically possessed guy running the Spear across the border to give it to her. It seems to me like it would have been in Gabriel's best interest if demons weren't crossing over. She could have done all this a lot more inconspicuously. But of course, I'm not even sure that she was the cause of that or wanted that to happen. Are the demons who attack Angela out in the open working for Gabriel, or are they also trying to stop this from happening so Maman can't take Satan's self-claimed kingdom from him? Except I doubt that's it, because Satan himself doesn't seem to realize any of this is happening, and only shows up at the end because John kills himself, and John's the one soul he'd come up to collect himself. And luckily for John, that turned out to be true, and not just a legend spread because of John's reputation. I think the real reason we've got demons crossing over is so A, the stakes will already feel high before we get to the third act, and the Maman scenario won't seem to come out of nowhere, and B, so John has more CG creatures to fight. Even though that doesn't happen a lot, and he still deals with half-breeds a lot more than full-fledged demons, I don't know, it's kind of a pointless plot point. It's also unclear as to what exactly is going on with Gabriel's relationship with God during the climax. In order for Maman to cross over, we're told that he needs a powerful psychic and help from God, which I assume is why Gabriel is able to achieve this. She has part of God's power, so she is the help from God. But when Satan stops her, she's unable to fight his power because, as he says, someone doesn't have your back anymore. Has she lost her power from God? Did it happen in the moment when she was trying to bring Maman? Or is it that just by virtue of being an angel, she could have brought Maman, but that God isn't going to help her against Satan because of the path she's taken? I don't know. Regardless of all that, the real question is, if God knows what she's up to, 
which I have to assume because why else wouldn't she have his protection, why didn't he interfere with her bringing Mama? on? If it weren't for John summoning Satan, that would have happened, and his getting involved wouldn't have been against the rules because it's not direct interference in human affairs. It's keeping your own people in line. Obviously, what she's doing is a direct violation of the balance between heaven and hell. Now, if God was, for whatever reason, as limited as Satan, where he just didn't know this was happening, I might buy it. But he's clearly the all-seeing, all-knowing God, and so once Gabriel can't stand against Satan, it deflates all the tension in that scene, because there really shouldn't be any danger of Maman crossing over at all, unless, for some reason, it's against the rules for him to do exactly what Satan does when he stops Gabriel— I suppose he could know the future, see how it all turns out, and knows that, again, by letting all this happen, he's helping John to see the light and do the right thing. But that still drops the stakes because it means there was never any real danger of Armageddon to begin with. Now, the movie has the same problem Gabriel does. It's just too ambitious. The other element that drives me absolutely bananas is the half-breeds. I just don't understand what the heck they are. Demons and angels can influence people through possession and whispering and such, but they can't come straight over. But we have characters like Balthazar and Gabriel who are physically in our world, aren't possessing anyone, and are called half-breeds. Now, you'd think that would imply they're part human, but that doesn't match with Gabriel's endgame because she's not human. She doesn't understand humans. And she hates that she isn't given the same privileges as God's elite. Okay, then what is she? Whenever a half-breed demon gets hit with holy water or dragon's breath, their skin melts away, revealing a demon underneath, as if they're wearing a human suit like the aliens in Men in Black. When it happens to Balthazar, he says on natural, implying the human skin is a disguise. They don't seem to be the product of humans and demons breeding, because as we see in the end credits scene, at least one of them used to be human and was resurrected as a half-breed? And besides, if demons and angels can't cross over, how could demons and humans procreate? Unless it started eons ago, and there was a time demons and angels could be on Earth, but after centuries of being in the gene pool with just humans, I'd figure the demon or angel percentages would be negligible. And again, we've got Chaz turning into an angel at the end. And that really confuses Gabriel's motivations. So, did she used to be human, but now she's not, so she doesn't get the privilege of absolution? Are there a lot of different ways to become a half-breed? I don't understand. It's also bizarre to me, considering how bent out of shape Gabriel is about God's favoring humans, that Balthazar would fall for John's bluff of pretending to absolve him and send him to heaven. Silly enough that he buys it since, as John says, you have to ask for forgiveness, and he'd obviously know that. But the movie there doesn't address that that's a privilege reserved for humans in the first place, and this guy's working for an angel whose whole thing is she's ticked off about that. I had hoped perhaps some of the deleted scenes, and there are a lot of them, might shed some light on some of this, and they don't really, but the movie would feel more complete if some of them were put back in. I appreciate the quick cutting of the flashbacks when John's explaining his origin to Angela, but it would have been nice to know that he had slit his wrist, since that's how he kills himself again at the end. And I would have also liked to keep the attempted exorcism before he kills himself, because it's neat to know how he's introduced to that idea, and I like that he would then grow up and become a real exorcist after dealing with a priest who has no idea what's really out there. There's also an entire motif that's scrapped from the final version, which I am baffled by because it would have tied the ideas together much more tightly, and it's kind of a no-brainer. Beeman has a repeated line that doesn't make it into the movie, where he keeps talking about a new game. And there's the deleted scene where Chaz writes that on a bowling ball and then throws it and gets a strike, which might foreshadow John's defeating Gabriel at the end, or it might speak to Chaz's eternal optimism expecting everything to go off without a hitch, just like in the books. And he'll learn later, of course, things never work out that cleanly. Beeman lives above the bowling alley, and if this idea of games was brought more to the forefront, that would have transformed into a metaphor for the game Heaven and Hell are playing with people's souls. Beeman's place represents the inner workings of the game, which John can see but almost nobody else can. Like in a bowling alley, we can only see the playing pieces but not the gears and mechanisms behind it, which are Heaven and Hell. I racked my brain the whole movie this last watch, trying to determine if there was some sort of significance to the choice of putting John behind a bowling alley, and that didn't leap out at me until I watched the deleted scenes. That's a shame. There's also a small thread that was cut involving John sleeping with a half-breed demon girl, which was cut to make John seem lonelier. It's not great, and I think it plays fine without it, but I do like the idea that John has accepted his fate to the point that he's basically just living in hell before he really gets there. 
So I'm going to give Constantine a 2.5 out of 4. In not trusting the comic source material to stand on its own, it creates its own loosely adapted world and manages to avoid some of the insecurities that plagued a lot of these pubescent superhero movies. But it becomes that overconfident teenager that's so wrapped up in itself it sometimes can't see the forest for the trees. Or in this case, the demons from the half-breeds. Ba, ba, ba. 